Welcome everybody to the fifth conversation in the series Rejvej Opera of CESEM, Center for the Study of the Sociology and Aesthetics of Music of the Universidad Nova de Lisboa. I'd like to thank Juan Pedro Cachopo, the coordinator of the Opera Studies Research Line for his enthusiastic support for the idea of discussing this opera, The Sleeping Thousand, with its composer, Adam Maor, and the director and writer, Jonathan Levy. Uh, Jonathan will be uh, joining us shortly. And um, in the meantime, I'd say um, we will listen just to a few minutes of the last part of the opera, a solo uh, of the figure called Nurit. So uh, let's just listen to a few minutes um, of this while we're waiting, and then I will introduce our guests and go from them. Ah. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
<laughs> we can stop now, maybe. Some bit. Okay, so now let me uh, introduce our guests. Adam Maor, the composer of Sleeping Thousand, and Jonathan Levy, uh, the writer and uh, producer of the opera. I, I have great pleasure in seeing you. I had a wonderful conversation with you on, on Saturday, and it's, um, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, so I will start by saying a few words about each of you, and then I will explain a little my connection to the project. Uh, and then I will put some questions to you for discussion for half an hour or so, and then we will invite the audience to put their, their questions. So uh, I will start by introducing Adam. Adam Mao's music is inspired by the reality that surrounds him both in Israel and in the Middle East in general, often using electronics as a device that connects his extra musical ideas to the instrumental fabric. Born in Haifa in 1983, he has written pieces spanning from orchestral to solo pieces with and without electronics, as well as vocal music. He began his musical journey studying classical guitar in the Conservatory of Haifa and subsequently composition with Eitan Steinberg. After refusing to join the Israeli army for conscientious reasons, he was imprisoned for a period of almost two years between 2002 and 2004. After his liberation, he continued his political activities for which he was nominated to the Ypres Prize for Peace in 2005. He pursued his composition and electronic music studies at, in Geneva and then subsequently at IRCAM in Paris, 2011 to 12. At the, in the same year, he began studying the Oud at the Paris Conservatory of Oriental Music with Michel Arkash. He taught composition and electronic music at the Musrara School of Art and was assistant artistic director at the Zlil Meudkan Festival, Tel Aviv. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Okay. Passionate about written language, he has composed many vocal and instrumental pieces inspired the poesy, by the poesy of Yitzhak Laor. In 2016, he was awarded the Israeli Prime Minister Prize for Creation. And uh, Jonathan Levy, uh, is a director, playwright, journalist, Waldorf educator, and social entrepreneur. He directed and wrote the libretto for The Sleeping Thousand, premiered at the Festival d'Aix-en-Provence in 2019 with the collaboration of the Théâtre de la Ville de Luxembourg. His work, Saddam Hussein, a mystery play, text, direction, design, and music all by him, was featured in the Theater der Welt Festival in Mannheim, the Pilsen Theater Festival, and the Schaubühne International New Drama Festival in Berlin. Uh, Jonathan co-founded the Shaked Waldorf High School, the Sheikh Abreik Festival for Civilian Culture, and the Social Arts Mill, all in his hometown of Kiryat Tivon, Israel. So um, now I will say a few words about uh, how I was connected to this project. Uh, I was director of the opera studio of the Schorspior de Musica here in Lisbon between 2011 and 2015. And through that, I was involved in workshops of the European Network of Opera Academies, of which our school here in Lisbon and the one in Porto are associate members. The Gulbenkian Foundation, as a founder member of Inoa, along with the Festival d'Aix-en-Provence, has run workshops every two years for eight young composers from Portugal and from the other countries represented by Inoa partners. The workshop of 2014 was given by Magnus Lindbergh and included uh, Portuguese uh, young composers Nuno Rocha, Igor Silva and Pedro Fria Gomes and Daniel Moreira, as well as Frederick Neding and others from abroad. I came up with the idea of a collaborative opera project around the subject of Orpheus that could involve some or all of the eight composers and which would build on previous presentations of the myth as well as looking at the origins of the myth in the Middle East. I chose the figure of Orpheus because of his ambivalent role as composer, poet and performer 
good for encouraging composers towards thinking about performance in new ways. With the encouragement of Miguel Sobrasi in Gulbenkian, I presented this project to the Enoa partners at their meeting in the X Festival of that year. And this eventually led to uh, the creation of a workshop for writers and composers with Martin Krimp and myself in Ghent in 2015 called Orpheus Looking Back, Looking Forward, and of which Adam uh, was one of the eight composers. So this was one of the starting points for this uh, opera, The Sleeping Thousand. And uh, another one was, as I discovered on Saturday, a project of Jonathan's. And so I would like to start by asking you, Jonathan, um, that uh, about this project of yours, you told me you were trying to write a novel, uh, which I suppose reflected your social activism and uh, Waldorf philosophy. And I'd very much like to hear uh, you talk a little bit about this. Uh, about the novel, about writing it? Yes, and about where, what, you, uh, what uh, sources you draw from. Um, um, well, the sources, of course, of this uh, this story is uh, is reality. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a fact that uh, Israel holds uh, some several hundred uh, detainees, and uh, occasionally they go on a hunger strike. And the story kind of stemmed out of my okay. imagination uh, at, at one of these occasions. Like I was thinking, well, if I was uh, the evil empire, what would I do? Uh, and this kind of spun the story. And uh, and uh, the, the reason of writing it was I, I was actually in a financial uh, crisis and I, need, uh, I needed uh, work. And uh, so I asked a friend of mine who is this activist, uh, what would happen if I would write a book that would change the consciousness of everyone who would read it? Uh, and I told him that I can't promise him I would accomplish this task, but I can promise to try. Uh, and he was kind of wealthy, and he said, uh, okay, I would support you. So I asked a few, uh, a stipend, and got it. So, so everything was be beginning from greed and, and, uh, and lack of money. <laughs> there was no real idealism behind anything. Uh, okay. Of course, uh, and then uh, when Adam approached me, uh, following your workshop in Ghent, uh, yep. searching for some uh, idea for an opera, uh, and we, we got along uh, very good, very quickly. And then uh, when I told him about this book, and he, he said, yes, this, this is our opera. Uh, okay. th this is our story. We're going to go on this one. Because we tried all kinds of uh, ideas about Adam's uh, military non-service yes. and, uh, and so on. Uh, but this is how it all began. That's, that's very good. That's great. So now let me ask Adam. I remember talking to you in Ghent. Uh, uh, I remember for a start making a presentation about the Mesopotamian origins of the Orpheus myth. Uh, I talked a lot about uh, the journey to the underworld by the goddess Inanna. Uh, and I also talked a good deal about the Kinua, uh, which was in fact the lyre, the instrument that was played not merely by Orpheus, but also by King David in Jerusalem. It was essentially the same instrument. Uh, and this got me thinking about how uh, King David really uh, based his ideas of kingship and the lyre playing, uh, not so much on a, a Jewish tradition as a Canaanite tradition. And it seemed to me that this was a very interesting way of uh, making some bridges over uh, over different cultures. Um, so, um, and I remember you telling me at the time that the, uh, that, uh, the name Kinua had been in the meantime applied to the violin um, and uh, that this was a kind of uh, um, a spontaneous decision that didn't have much uh, uh, historical uh, reasoning for it, if I remember rightly. Perhaps you could tell us uh, how you felt in, in Ghent and uh, how this uh, 
what what you thought you would be doing until you met uh, Jonathan and discovered his novel. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember very well this this workshop in Ghent because uh, both your uh, your presentation and, and also Martin Martin Krim's work uh, around this myth um, were, were fascinating and, and, and inspiring and. Um, and I loved this approach of, of trying to find the connection, right? Trying not only to declare this is, this is a, a, a profound myth of ours and no one else can touch it. And, and it's always lovely when you see that, uh, well, the Jewish Bible also is also, also based on more ancient myth and, and there's always a connection and inspiration. Um, I remember, I remember, you know, feeling very, very much inspired the, later in the opera, um, the violin and, and an entire string section was, was the basis of, of the ensemble, thinking these are instruments that are also considered, you know, uh, without time always had been European and, and actually has the, have their origin in, in, um, in the Middle East. Yeah. And stylistically can uh, allow us to go through different kinds of music. Okay. Um, and uh, what happened about our project was that I, I showed up in this in this workshop of Ghent, and and what's so nice about the Enoa uh, network and and about the way they think is that they kept saying we we want artistic projects and we we want you to. Think of what you what you want to do you the most. I thought, what do I want to do the most? Well, I met this guy. At, uh, I saw this guy's uh, theater piece a couple of weeks ago, and I want to work with him. <laughs> uh, I actually saw Saddam uh, uh, the, the piece yep. you mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I found that uh, I found it brilliant, and I found that. that um, it's such a such a wonderful work on the Hebrew language, my language and the language I wanted to write in, and also work uh, around this Middle Eastern myth, actually. Um, so, so I felt a, a very strong connection to Jonathan's work, um, and then yeah, I, I, I called him and and we went through uh, new ideas and ideas I came with. Um, uh, in, uh, in from Ghent and and uh, and old pieces of Jonathan, and we, nothing was quite right. And and then he told me the story that would become the story of this opera. And uh, it felt immediately uh, both a connection to the myth of Orpheus, but uh, but also something that uh, mm -hmm. has a, a very very beautiful saying about uh, about the present. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, so uh, obviously, the, the, uh, Jonathan has a very strong interest. You have a very strong interest in music, and uh, uh, you, Adam, have a very strong interest in words, as you explained. So uh, this is uh, this is already something uh, a kind of marriage made in heaven. <laughs> uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how this um, opera developed. So I know Inoa has a specific way of creating uh, uh, workshops or laboratories, uh, laboratory uh, um, moments uh, in creation. And I believe that you had one, uh, you had one, well, the next time we saw each other and the first time I met Jonathan was in Brussels when you were presenting the project. Um, and then the, uh, you got enough support from the different partners. And then I believe you had a, some kind of lab uh, uh, working in Alderbro. Is that correct? Perhaps you both like to say something about that experience. Um, Jonathan, would you? Do you want to? Uh, <clears throat> yes, it was a series of workshops conducted by Enwa, and uh, as a process, it was extremely helpful. Like we had this pitch to do, so we had to form the story. And then we had the workshop in, I think, in Helsinki. Was it the first one, Adam? Yeah. Uh, and that was about uh, directing and movement. Okay. So it helped just uh, to, to serve as a sandbox 
long before the actual libretto was ready, we could kind of play around with concepts and, uh, and check out the transition from a written word to composed word and, and then to performed word. So it was extremely helpful, a very, a very well uh, constructed workshop. And then we had this residency in Britain's house to write the actual thing. Uh, and all along, uh, then was very supportive. So uh, uh, I have nothing but good words to, to, to say about uh, how, how, you know, this idea, which these ideas don't always work. You know, sometimes there's excellent goodwill and yeah, let's uh, promote young uh, opera creators. And some projects work and some doesn't, don't work. And this for us worked superbly. Okay. And Adam, uh, I know you said to me that there wasn't very much music involved in Aldebra. It was more, more text. Is that right? Um, yeah. So we were very lucky, Jonathan and I, to have the workshop in in uh, in Helsinki because it was the first time we actually collaborated on uh, on a text put to music, and uh, and it was the first time Jonathan could see uh, what I would do with these words, which is. Um, Something I was lucky that we did we didn't leave for the last uh, <laughs> last month of the rehearsals, um, and uh, and so we we came to Albro after having worked a bit, mm -hmm. uh, having our sketches played and and performed. Okay. And then, yes, Albro. We I mean, what I mostly did was uh, to encourage Jonathan to write. Uh, we spent uh, ten days exchanging, and and uh, um, so I think all we came out with uh, physically was uh, text, but at the same time, uh, while exchanging about uh, about the text, we had ideas about music. We had ideas yep. about staging. Uh, um, it was a. Uh, the best part about about doing this project together, right, is, is to to be able to exchange at any moment about all the parts, you know, all the, the bits. Yeah, fantastic. So um, you were already gradually getting some ideas about which players you might uh, be able to use, what kind of uh, instrumental ensemble uh, was. Did this come in pretty early or? Uh, was this uh, a later uh, decision? Obviously, there's an economical side of this. Uh, so uh, money comes in everywhere, as Jonathan has already <laughs> told yes. us. <laughs> so I, um, anyone was expecting us both, I think, for um, financial reasons and also for artistic reasons, because they wanted us to justify the instruments that are on stage or, or in the pit. Or, so I think there's a, a will to, to have. It's not only about knowing what are, what will be the expenses. Of course, of course, it's important, but also to to make sure that we had thought about the artistic implications of every uh, every instrumentalist. Nothing is free. Okay, so you ended up with uh, the the instrumental group you had for the opera were from Luxembourg. Is that right? From Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they are they are a um, very uh, experienced contemporary music group is uh, that have played for a number of operas if I've understood it or a lot of operas over the years. Um, yeah, is, is called the United the United Instruments of Lucilin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an established uh, contemporary music ensemble. They have a lot of experience, uh, as you said, in mm -hmm. playing uh, new music and. Also in playing together, it's a very nice ensemble. Okay, um, and uh, so you've got your seven uh, instrumentalists, or is it eight? Um, it's, um, seven, uh, seven people playing an instrument, and one people playing a MIDI keyboard for the electronic. Okay, one. right. Okay, and you mentioned to me that the clarinetist had an ancient Egyptian. Um, instrument as well. Can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, that, uh, once again, the, the pleasure of, of being able to work together. So uh, Enoa had allowed me to to go workshop with the musicians of Lucilin a year and a half before the premiere. 
So mm -hmm. I, I had just started thinking about music. I had a couple of sketches and, and, and then the clarinet player came to me and said, uh, I, I, I read about your piece and, and I wondered if you knew, knew about this instrument called Argul. And Argul is a, uh, an instrument from the period of the Pharaon. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it has the mouthpiece of a clarinet. The clarinet is actually a, a, was born from taking the mouthpiece of the Argul on a, on a flute. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a very in, ancient instrument that is still played in um, Egypt and uh, in Sardinia. Um, and I, well, he, he played it, and of course I found it very appropriate for, uh, for our kind of uh, uh, project mm -hmm. to use it. So, we, so he has a, an Agul solo towards the end. Okay, very good. So maybe I could ask you, Jonathan, a question about ritual. Um, there's obviously a, a strong ritual element in this piece. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this aspect of theater? I, uh, well, I find it actually the main aspect of theater itself. Uh, mm -hmm. It stemmed from theater, stemmed from the ritual, from the Greek rituals, and in all the world, we see that the artistic performance is in a way a reminiscent of a of the uh, of the religious or uh, spiritual one, uh, mm. and now the 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 uh, <clears throat> the gap between uh, the gods and us is bigger. So we do arts and we don't do, we do ritual. But basically, I find the that that when you do art, you try to convey something from the hidden world, some kind of intuition or insight, or uh, some kind of sense or even the outlook, how to look at political situation. Do you look at it from some kind of ideology, the left ideology, the right ideology, or do you try and look at the world uh, as if from, uh, from uh, the, the spiritual standpoint? Mm -hmm. And uh, we are not shamans and not prophets. We, we are only artists, but we can do as best as we can to bring something uh, from from that uh, dimension, uh, and yes, that, that in, in a way that is my main drive, my main artistic drive. Whether the pieces and the works are political, uh, overtly political or not, uh, it comes from there. Yeah, and Adam, do you see writing a musical score as in some way having a ritual element to it? Your, your. Sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's uh, there's definitely an element of ritual that is felt by all musicians, right? Because we, uh, it, it's very clear that you you need to put yourself in this head head space that is not completely rational if you want to to, you know, be able to communicate with your public. You need to to put yourself in this almost. Uh, um, ecstatic, uh, almost ecstatic uh, uh, position, right? Um, so, so I think of it when I write, and I think of it um, when 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 my music is performed. I um, there's a part of let's say I, I never um, rationalized it before meeting Jonathan and. Um, Something about about our our conversation, conversations that made me. I think maybe it's because in music it's sometimes almost obvious, right? Because it, it's yeah. not having text. It's it's all about the ritual. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I, I think having um, having acknowledged this this connection between what we do and ritual is is. Uh, it's extremely enriching, and um, I think you, when we talked, you asked me about about this project. The opera itself has very a couple of scenes that are very clearly about rituals, right? And they're inspired by ritualistic music of different cultures, and um, so so it, it's it's very present in the Sleeping Thousand. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say would you connect this also with the? Uh, with Hebrew as a language, which obviously for us, uh, who don't know much about it, but we, our culture has been heavily influenced 
uh, hugely, enormously influenced by the Bible and uh, to a lesser extent, Hebrew as a language. Um, is, is the, does the Hebrew language uh, automatically uh, bring one to a more ritualistic uh, way of, of thinking in some way? Uh, Jonathan, what, what would you say? I would say it's not automatically. <laughs> you know, you've got millions of Hebrew speakers who have nothing to do with that kind of uh, output. But yeah. uh, Hebrew, of course, uh, is considered, in, in my eyes, rightly so, as some as a, as an ancient language which is, uh, in a way, a condensification of spirit itself. Okay, it, it is a. Uh, it is not just a, a convention. Uh, it's not a conventional language that you can arbitrary choice of words. In in a way, every word and the same thing is I think in every uh, uh, every language, uh, every word is a onomatopoeia uh, in in sense that there is an intrinsic connection between the sound and the meaning, and this special. Uh, sensibility of uh, penetrating the, the, the connection between how a uh, word sounds, which consonants does it were use, which vowels does it uh, implement in each and every word, uh, and the actual meaning of it is a magic, uh, is, a, is a magic uh, feeling of, of, of Hebrew. And of course, the, the, the first performances, artistic performances of Hebrew, as in Greek and as in every language, uh, they are ritualistic, they are religious rites, they are prayers, they are uh, uh, ceremonies. And in our uh, opera, we also have this kind of mock uh, religious music uh, of, uh, of Chazanic singing mm -hmm. of a kind of local newspaper somewhere in Israel. So using this kind of, and, and also playing with a, with a pinch of salt because when you be too when one in modern times is too spiritual it gets pompous and ineffective you know you, you try to be something which we are already not uh, and making this combination between I would say true and genuine pathos a uh, spiritual pathos and some kind of taking it not all too seriously uh, is, I would say, the, the, the contemporary, our contemporary approach to dealing with this. Not being just, you know, purely cynical and, and, and disbelieving everything, but not preaching. Uh, and, but bringing something which has a, a, a um, complexity uh, mm -hmm. in regard to the spiritual and art. Okay, very good. Um, well, maybe I will mention a, a word um, uh, that uh, gets more at the political side of things, which is gender. Gender as power politics, gender in the opera, gender as rela power relations. And maybe uh, you could comment on uh, the, the Arab-Israeli, Palestinian-Israeli, uh, relationship in this respect. I remember, Adam, you told me that your grandfather, I think, was chief rabbi in, in Damascus. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, how do you feel about this uh, relation? So obviously you you have a feeling for the, the Palestinian side of uh, the Palestinian culture in some way. Um, uh, so I know these are heavy questions, but uh, in in what way do you, and of course the end of the opera with Nurit Solo that we heard some of, I believe you included some of your wood playing in the in the um, uh, in the the electronic accompaniment. Uh, so can you comment on this? this side as a composer. I've often thought uh, that our relationships in classical music have also been very much, um, very heavily gendered in the sense of composer and performer. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that it's actually 
been very difficult for people to uh, easily move from one side to another, uh, from being a performer to being a composer, or the other way around, maybe because of these stupid uh, gender um, uh, forces that uh, tend to push us into particular roles as if we're in a quarreling family, <laughs> uh, fathers and mothers and children. I don't know, what would you say about that, Adam? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I, I am going to speak to exactly what you mean, but feel free to guide me if I'm off the point. Um, what I loved most when, when Jonathan told me this idea and when I, when I figure out where he where is, is trying to go is that um, uh, the story starts with something you can read about in the news next week, right? Uh, a massive hunger strike. Uh, is, is actually something that, that happened, right? And, and, and can definitely happen again. And it ends in something that, um, in a message that is, that is completely um, outside Middle Eastern politics. It, it, it's very connected to Middle Eastern politics. And, and it is the moment where artistically we decided to go um, as clearly back to the Middle East as, as we can. Um, mm -hmm. But, but the message is about people shedding off their, uh, their, these imposed identities as, as, yep. you, as you described it. And uh, I thought that was a very powerful message. Um, and, yep. and, and, I think, and I think I'm very happy with our decision in, in, to, to do both at the same time, right? To, to, to get as closely connected to our origins, to our uh, to, to the environment, at the same time as saying we, you know, we take everything, but we take nothing of that, of that, of this decision to to put us on on uh, on a quarreling side, uh, um, and and and, yeah. and well, you connected you connected me to to the history of my family. Then definitely, you know, I mean. The country where my grandparents were born is officially uh, at war with the country I live in or I was raised in. So there's, it's, it's, there's something that doesn't make sense. And, 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 and at the same time, uh, I, I wish to be as connected uh, as possible to, to both places. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, I mean, of course, I, I don't, I, 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 at the same time, these politics are, are incredibly uh, hurtful and and, and, uh, and useless to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to add something? Um, uh, I think that Adam put it very beautifully that uh, <laughs> the, the essence about identi identity politi politics is transcending them in, in a way or both including them and transcending them mm -hmm. uh, at, at, in the same time. And uh, this opera was written from, I would say, the, like the Jewish standpoint. Uh, the Palestinians there are, in a way, a projection of, of the Ju Jewish trauma uh, and Jewish fear. So this is kind of demonized and victimized at the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, in a way, what the heroine uh, Nuri does is just crossing the lines, is meeting the other. And uh, for every person and for in every conflict, uh, understanding the other is a completely different challenge. Like, as Jews, we might try to connect to the other Arab. As males, we may connect to the, uh, to the female. As left-wing liberals, we need to connect to the right-wing uh, way of thought. As right-wing Trumpists, we have to understand liberals, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. Every time you have this kind of challenge, which uh, demands you not to stay confined in your own kind of uh, well-justified just ideology and see what's, what's going on in other parts of humanity, whether you like them or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a way, the world always challenges us uh, individually and collectively. And uh, in a way, this kind of 
realistic fable is is about this uh, about kind of uh, th- this kind of challenge which faces humanity everywhere yeah fantastic thank you well I think we should try opening two questions from anybody who's listening to us uh, I don't know if uh, yes we have a question uh, Livia please go ahead um, here she comes oh hi everyone hello I'm speaking from Brazil and first of all I would like to say that I'm dazzled by your beautiful work your creation Adam and Jonathan and secondly I would like to ask if you both could tell us about specific moments when you have changed things or or add things uh, because um each other needs or demands. For example, Jonathan, have you made changes on your libretto because Adam asked you to, or because you realized that any change would uh, be better for the music writing? Um, yes, of course. The, the, the libretto, the process of libretto, I, I think it was very dialogical because we had the story to begin with and I wrote the first draft of the libretto with Adam in, uh, sitting in my sitting next to me. So energetically, there's also it's like a it's like a relationship. Something in the creation is it has to it has to do with the people the person that you're talking with all day. Okay, there's this kind of a uh, dialectical field in which the uh, the, the process uh, develops. And Adam was my partner for this. So the, the, the whole thing was between us, always talking about things and considering them differently and again and again and again and building this together. Uh, the next step in a way is what I, I wrote this kind of draft, which was, I would say, 30% more than the actual libretto. And I handed it over to Adam and, and told him, okay, now, now it's your turn to make it 100% yours, like to fit the words into your uh, vision of the music and what needs to be to go, just throw it out and what needs to stay, keep it. And we were, uh, we had enough trust and mutual understanding to know what is the core of the work. So there was no fear in that sense. And on the third stage, Adam uh, brought it back and said, okay, this is my edit. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you think? And, you know, it was 99% wonderful. And here and there, we said, okay, this needs another dramaturgical connection. And maybe we, when we also, when we already were in uh, Aix-en-Provence, so we added here two lines and there two lines. And, uh, and this was the, the process. It was very, we were very lucky and fortunate, I think, in that sense. Adam, what do you say? What do you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually starting this uh, project, I, I never thought um, Jonathan would be uh, as open as, uh, as he was with his text. And I think, you know, um, standing behind him, so his, his shoulder when, while he was writing was a, um, a very good move. Um, so I, I think uh, if I may uh, disagree with Jonathan, I don't think there was uh, 30% more. I think there was something like 300% more text. <laughs> And, and at the same time, we had the, the novel that was not entirely written, but there were a lot of, a lot of uh, other materials that ended up in the libretto. And, um, and uh, I, I, I felt extremely fortunate to have, to have Jonathan Jonathan just told me, now this is yours, take it. And I came back after two, three weeks. And, and we, I think for about six months, we had, we had the exchange and, and actually, um, and actually, I, at a certain point, I said, okay, need, here I need a couple of words more. And here I, I so I, I, I didn't, it's not only that I could take out stuff, I, I, I felt free to, to ask him to write uh, new materials and, um, and uh, free to, uh, to take out stuff. 
And then at the same time, there, for, for example, there was uh, something I, I took out that I shouldn't have taken out and we arrived to rehearsal and, and Jonathan told me, uh, I, need some, I need something there that it's not, uh, and, I, and I ended up writing a, a bit while rehearsing was already, had already started. So the, there's one solo of the piece that was written on the first week of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank and you very much. Thank you. Great. <laughs> So I don't know if we have. I have I have a question. Good. Which is not without relation um, to the previous one. So I think it's a good moment to to ask it. It's actually curiosity. I'm I'm curious about your perception uh, of how opera creators, let's say, collaborate today. Um, and I don't mean your specific case. You you talk about it already. I'm I'm curious about your perception more more generally. Um, the situation seems to be changing very quickly. Um, the role of the stage director is becoming more and more prominent. Uh, in your case, Jonathan accumulates uh, the role of the librettist and the stage director, and there's the composer, of course. But as I said, I'm not only interested in, on how you work together, but on your perception of the, the broader uh, situation. Uh, do you think it's a good thing or is it a bad thing that this, that these, the figure of the stage director is becoming so important to the point that there are some productions where it stands out as the main figure of the production? Um, I'm curious about your perception of this entire um, new scenario, let's say. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to say something maybe a bit controversial and I'm, I'm can't sign on it 100%, but I do have a feeling that the fact that um, stage, stage director becomes this important is that because they, they're always playing the same pieces, right? So if you don't, so the, the librettist is almost always the same guy and the composer is almost always the same guy, and they're both dead then the stage director becomes very important. I think it's, it, I mean, with, with, with the huge respect I, I, I have for this, uh, for this profession, um, I think it also comes with the fact that the, the body of works is, is always, is so, well, so small. Uh, I don't know, I think, uh... Uh, I did think about what Adam said. It made me think uh, again about my own uh, answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, it very much depends if it's a good stage director, I guess. You know, if, if it's a not very good st stage director, he should not be as so important. But if he's okay, you know, uh, it's fine. I, I think that there can't be any generally applied rule for this. Uh, I do think in the broader sense, there is a sense of also collaboration. Uh, and uh, I, I think that this kind of uh, traditional uh, dictator director figure, which you have in operas or in big theaters and generally in culture, I would say, you know, carefully that this role is on the decline. Uh, for more dialogical and kind of uh, horizontal approaches and in in, uh, in in creation, of course there needs there, there it, there's a balance uh, which needs to be maintained between like the individual vision of artistic piece and the way that a idea can be fructified by dialogue. It's kind of these two aspects of I have an individual artist which wants to do it this way and only that way, and this is what I dreamt of. So this is one part of, of being a director. But if you have only that side, you of course you, you become a, a tyrant and and there's something limited even in the art. And once you know how to work with people and let other visions or other wishes, be included in your own, uh, there is this kind of fructification. There is, it, is, it becomes a fertile uh, situation. And with Adam, this is what I felt like, okay, I, I, I can direct this because I have a certain concept of how it has to be, but 
if I'm just, you know, only with that, uh, there's a limit to my, to, there's a limit to the achievement. And if you can be connected with other people and what they have to say and what they have to give to the world, then your own creation gets uh, bigger and better. Right. I, I, I don't know if that is what you ask. It, it's a bit yeah. kind of uh, maybe in the broader sense. Yeah, of course. And there's also the question whether um, we are talking of a pre-existing opera or a new opera. And I think you both, you, you are both considering the, the second scenario where you, you, we are talking about an, an actual collaboration about three, pe three people who are living and collaborating together. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm also curious if I, I want to add something. Sometimes there's also a, a fourth figure. So the video director, the one uh, filming uh, the production. Uh, in which case there's also, let's say, a fourth layer of complexity. There's a fourth person who might make decisions which will impact how the production impacts the, the, the audience. Uh, I don't know if this is something you would like to, to comment on, but... Uh, you say video in the sense of documentation or video being part of the piece? Well, I think that the boundary uh, between the two is not clear. You see, so I understand. So one thing would be to have like a, a production where it's thought right from the beginning that this video, the um, let's say the, the filming will, will make part of the show, will make part of the production. But even when this is not the case, there might be some room for creativity for the video director. I mean, I, I'm I'm saying this as an affirm as a sent as an affirmative sentence, but it's also a question. I don't know if you agree with this with this I notion. Think, uh, the, the very boundary between documentation and document and uh, let's say creativity is not that clear. I think two people who are more serious than Jonathan and I would have definitely thought about what kind of video documentation uh, this this should have. Uh, what happened to us was that we were so concentrated about creating the piece that we, we kind of forgot about, uh, about, the, about documentation and, uh, and we ended up with what you saw, which is just, just um, a video camera that, uh, that the festival had put in the hall. Um, it, it, is very, it is very important and, and, um, and I think uh, we, we had, did have a, lot, a couple of conversations about, uh, you know, what how great the medium of of of, uh, of video can be uh for an opera and what we could do on a video version that we we, we couldn't we couldn't do on stage um but uh, but also uh, i think the, i think that our, our artistic choice was not to have video on stage not to have video as a part of the of the scenic work um, and the idea of, uh, of of producing something that is only done uh, should only be seen uh, on video is something we, we we didn't do yet we didn't think about it um, I, I would just like to add um, uh, to that that my original idea for the workshop was to have also stage producers involved, stage directors involved in the, um, in the process so that uh, there would be an input from that side uh, from an early, early point in the, in the creative process, which I think would have been very interesting. It, it might not necessarily work well every time, but it would, be, uh, would have been a very interesting thing to do, but uh, it wasn't possible under the circumstances. Um, so, um, anyway. I think Helen has a question. I just want to, to say, I didn't ask this question with your specific case in mind. It was a broad question, okay? So I totally understand that the video you you shared with us is a, is a document and there there's no problem with that. I was just curious about your perception of the situation more broadly. Thank you for your answers. So, Yelena, do you have a, a, a question for us? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome. It's nice to have you as part of these conversations. Well, maybe I will pose a difficult question. Um, it's obvious that this piece is dealing with uh, questions of power and politics, but somehow for me it stayed blurred uh, what would be the political statement of this piece. So the question for both of you is if you can just shortly like uh, uh, put uh, the what would be the political statement of the piece and also in relation to that to tell a little bit more maybe uh, how was the reception of the piece. You want to go Jonathan? Okay. Uh, the political statement uh, for me uh, is how do you approach politics? Uh, it's not like this side is the right ones and this side is the, the, not, or the unjust and, and so on. It is what happens in, in, in the actual state of conflict universally. How does uh, being a victim evolve into be a, an aggressor and how this cycle is actually kind of perpetual and uh, today's victim is tomorrow's aggressor and so on. And <clears throat> how do you actually approach the, the question of identity, uh, which is the sort of conflict? And from what standpoint uh, one as a human being can bring uh, something which will heal uh, and, I don't know, amend the, the situation? So. You are perfectly right in saying that there is no commitment uh, to like being pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli in that sense. Uh, for me, I'm I'm actually opposed to that as a political statement. Uh, I think that being one-sided in in that manner, uh, I, and I'm not implying that you are uh, promoting one-sidedness. But for, for no, me, no, the, sorry, just to interrupt you, I, I never thought that uh, the statement would be to take sides. Of course, of course, that's the statement uh, uh, would be like, what would you like to achieve in yes, terms yes, of yes. politics? I, I, thank you for, for, for this. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the achievement is to, I, I don't know, so even when you do, sometimes when you do art, it's not for this kind of well defined purpose of achieving something. You do it from some kind of outlook uh, and the creation is a product of your outlook. And if this, and if the work of art can uh, enliven, this, enliven this outlook in the audience, then, then it means that uh, it was a good work. Uh, and I would say, you know, that crossing the border uh, crossing your well, one's well-defined lines of ideology and identification is, in my opinion, the key move to political improvement. Like always see the other side along with your own side uh, in order to get a perspective of, of what's going on. Uh, and of course, there are this central metaphor of um, of being asleep and being awake and like what happens in in sleep uh, in which like i come from uh, the waldorf world and the, the anthrop anthroposophical uh, world in which sleep is envisioned as actually as a state of consciousness in which we are all united in okay when am i awake I need to kind of push away everybody, but when I fall asleep, I kind of merge with uh, with the other. Uh, it's right, even uh, even in a intimate co uh, conversation, and it applies on the wider sense of, of sleep and and awakeness in the, in in the cosmic sense for me. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but there, there it could be also a question because you already pointed uh, uh, in a replica before, uh, like this binarism that you insist on, like uh, female and male, 
and uh, I don't know, you gave many examples, but also with sleep and being awake, I don't see it as binary. Okay. I see it as, uh, I don't know, three, four system. I see it more as a relational than kind of black and white. So this, this could be also a point of criticism in, uh, in general. Like you can be half awake or you, you can, can be in a state that oh, yes. is not oh, yes. Yes. awake yes. or sleeping. Actually, I think that most of the time we are somewhere along the scale, wavering between awakeness and, and, and sleep. That's, that's very true. There's something like in this opera that uh, there's 25 people from the audience which are on stage. Okay. There's actually uh, 20 beds and there's this portion of the audience who is in the beds looking at the opera from, from, uh, as if from the background. And this, uh, maybe this kind of decision, which production wise was kind of complicated to, to, to achieve is also some kind of statement. Like these 25 representatives of the audience are sometimes they are actually portraying the Palestinian detainees. And in other scenes, they are portraying the Jewish population which suffers from uh, insomnia, okay? So actually we have these kind of, uh, uh, how do you call that, mitzavim, Adam, uh, I forgot the word. Hmm? Extras, extras. We've got these extras on stage, uh, which they're also at the same time as their audience, and they are image. Okay, they're part of the image which the grand uh, hall sees, and they see the audience portraying one time on one scene this side, and on one and on the other scene that side. So in a way, I would say that is my political statement. And of course, it's open to criticism. I guess everything is. Okay, thanks. Well, for me, I, what, what I liked again about this story is, is it, it always has a couple of levels, right? And I think uh, Jonathan just gave you a, um, a taste of, of, of how, how deep he can go. And I think... Um, in the opera and even more in, in, the, in the novel, there's always uh, contradiction, uh, contradictory notions and, and he, he makes a statement and then he immediately makes fun of his own statement. And then it's a very, um, he always tries to take a, a, a complex um, stand, right? Um, and at the same time, there's something very simple about this this story because it's it's like you said very 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 wisely it's about power it's also about the privation of, of freedom which is the, the most extreme uh, way of, of deprivation of, of freedom is putting someone in a in a coma right um and and i think and I think that it, it, it's a it's a very clear metaphor to to the to the occupation, and, and I think um, I think this this opera does take a, a stand against it. Um, I also think that the the levels of of of, uh, of reading of this text um, also can come with how much you. Um, you are familiar with the local cultures. For instance, um, our choice to, to have a, a canto reading the local newspaper um, with the, that is telling about the Jewish kids that cannot sleep and wake up speaking Arabic is a very uh, satirical moment that, that I think would make a lot of sense for everybody, everybody who's you know, both familiar with Israeli journalism and familiar with uh, with the Cantor tradition, and, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of interactions, um, for instance, between uh, Norit and the Prime Minister, are satirical moments about power that that can have a very um, um, straightforward reading, uh, political stra uh, political reading. So uh, so it. it um, if, if you take if you take a closer look to what Noit is singing at the end, I think you can get a um, 
the complex uh, message uh, that uh, Jonathan was trying to convey. And that, that is a, at the same time, that there's much, much clearer ideas that, that, that give structure to the, to the project. And was it performed in Israel? Unfortunately not. Are, are there any plans for... No, there's no plans for anything, right? We didn't even have our last uh, shows uh, that were planned. Um, and I think uh, one of the, the um, let me say, specifics of the of the genre of opera is that it's it, uh, extremely expensive to to have played. Uh, so we did have uh, uh, organizers and institutions from uh, from Israel interested, but no one who could uh, uh, fund the the yet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we asked the Israeli Opera and the Israel Festival, uh, and they don't have the money. They said that they won't, it won't cover the expenses of bringing all you know, this, uh, the beds and, and uh, Lucy Lynn ensemble. And, uh, and we actually got this uh, message that uh, we need either to, uh, that, that they're going to dismantle the set uh, soon. Uh, so I think that's the end of the project, unless okay. something very unexpected, some miracle happens. Uh, that's that. Yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's a, in a way, it's a, it's a big pity that this piece isn't performed in Israel. Uh, kind of. Uh, I don't need to add that when yeah. we started writing it uh, five years ago, it, it was unimaginable for me to that that it would be a political problem. Also, uh, with with. Um, uh, states of politics now, though, I mean, we are between governments for the last uh, year and a half, but um, with the way politics has been looking for the last two, three years, I think that anyone who would program it would uh, create some uh, some problems to himself. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. it is possible. Uh, especially, especially um, in relation to the to the amount of money that that uh, needs to be uh, invested in it, so you could definitely make a, a, a smaller project with the same uh, intentions, but uh, but to to have something this big and this critical at this point in, uh, in Israel would be very hard. If you're based on government money and you don't get all the tickets sold, <laughs> yeah. sure, okay. So I don't know if there are any other questions. Uh, I don't have access to any other questions. Um, so uh, unless somebody raises their virtual hand in the next few seconds, I think we can say well, this has been a fantastic uh, discussion. I've learned more things from this, uh, having had those wonderful conversations with you on Saturday as well. Uh, I'm so happy to have uh, been able to have you here and to talk with you. Uh, and I certainly hope that we don't lose touch and uh, that we hear that your opera is indeed going to be put on uh, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and uh, all over the place. Amen. <laughs> um, just, just tell me uh, where was where was where the planned uh, performances that didn't happen? Which, was this in Luxembourg or? Um, I no, think we could find in Luxembourg and uh, and in uh, Lisbon, but we could not in Brussels. We were supposed to. Ah, to in Brussels. Brussels. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was going to happen in Teatro La Monnaie as well. No. Okay, fine. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our audience who put the questions as well. Um, this has been really wonderful. And, thanks uh, for inviting us and thanks for listening. Thanks. Whoever you are. <laughs> okay. Great. So thanks for the questions and thank you, Nicholas. Okay. So bye to you all. I don't know who uh, takes us away, but. Uh, Let's hope that we'll be in, in touch. Uh, maybe we can find a way of bringing you here to Portugal again. <laughs>